Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Train, for contributing. <laughs> Good morning. Welcome to Bethany Lutheran Church on the fourth Sunday after Pentecost. It's also the summer solstice, the longest day of the year, more daylight than any other day. Also, the day when you see your shortest shadow because the sun is right over us. And it's Father's Day. All those things in one day. Congratulations to everyone here who is a father, and I'm very proud to include myself in that category. As you know, we are part of an innovative scheme to respect and appreciate God's wonderful world by recycling things that don't normally get recycled. There's a big box out in the narthex, and as you know, we're collecting that includes uh, thin plastic grocery bags, bubble wrap, Ziploc bags, you can look at the list out there. Do bring them in, tell your friends and neighbors too, so we can make our goal. We have six months to make our goal, so in December, we will have saved a tiny portion of our planet, but it all helps, doesn't it? Next Sunday will be Pastor Van Orden's last Sunday with us, and while he's not here, I just want to say this and not embarrass him, uh, I will really miss him, and I'm sure you will too. He's uh, contributed so much, and his wife, Lynn, also. I know that uh, um, Emily and myself and Lynn all contributed to making those videos for a whole year of virtual services. She did a great deal for that. Pastor Van Orden and I and Nancy Grimes, the three musketeers, we, we taught the confirmation class, which was also chaotic. Partly live, partly trying to capture wherever the kids were on their phones, on Zoom, uh, but we did it. And there were other drama and music projects. We were just fortunate that he stepped into the breach when we needed him, and uh, I wish them both a happy retirement. So do come next week and say goodbye to Pastor Van Orden, and tell your friends who are not here today. Uh, I may not be here, I'm having surgery on Friday. Just a minor operation, nothing to worry about. In fact, the surgeon told me I would be up and tap dancing by Sunday, but I think that's a little optimistic. So, uh, I hope to be here, but if I'm not, I'll be watching you online, and uh, I'll be with you spiritually. Um, I'm going to ask, uh, ask you to come up right now, Lois, and tell us what's going to happen after Pastor Van Orden leaves. We have an exciting new prospect for uh, pastors. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> we do have a lot of exciting news. Um, I just wanted to tell you that uh, uh, Pastor George, I think many of you will remember him because he filled in for Pastor when he was on vacation. He has agreed to be with the our uh, do our Sunday services, uh, July, August, and September, and Jonathan will still take his one Sunday also. Um, Pastor George will begin uh, July the 4th. So he was very anxious, uh, very happy to do that. And when I called Beth at the Synod, she was said, how did you do that? <laughs> and I said, oh, we were just very lucky to be able to get him to commit because then we have that continuity um, of a pastor, the same pastor every week. And uh, the more he does it, the more relaxed he will be also. Um, so that was very good news. And then the Synod called and said, well, at that point, I had only um, asked him for July and August. And he said, sure. Well, the Synod said, well, they like it for the whole quarter. So that would include September. So I called. Um, called him and he said oh yes he said that would be fine so it's july august and september that quarter and i was ready to hang up and he said oh lois wait a minute i said oh okay um he said well um how's the call committee i said well we really haven't heard anything from synod yet so we'll just have to wait and see he said well he said i will be with you as long as you're without a pastor Oh. Oh. So I called Synod and they were delighted. So Hope, I said it could be a long time. He said, we'll just, I said, we'll just play it by ear. And he said, well, as long as the congregation's happy, I said, we will be delighted. And um, so 
we really have a lot of positive things happening right now. So um, it was a good, um, it was a good week, that's for sure. So, and I know we'll all welcome Pastor George with open arms because he's a wonderful man. Okay, I think if you have any questions, call me because our communion schedule every once in a while will be a little bit different because of his schedule and Jonathan's schedule, but we'll go with the flow, that's for sure. So, okay, thank you. Does anyone else have any other announcements? Over the past year, several Bethany members passed away, and because our building was closed, we were unable to honor them at that time and give thanks for their lives. So, as you know, uh, together each week, we are going to remember one of those people who passed on. Today, we remember William Batchelor, known to all of us as Bill Batchelor. He was one of those unsung heroes who contributed so much to our church without making a fuss about it. He did so many things uh, with scouting, he was on committees, he helped to organize the readers to read the lessons for the services. He organized the palms for our home Sunday services. And he organized the flowers for us to come up and create our Easter cross uh, during the Easter service. And so many other things besides. Today we will remember Bill and his family in our prayers. And we will dedicate our hymn of the day to Bill. Uh, all of your service is contained in the booklet you have, and all the hymns will be in the hymn booklet, so you don't have to hunt around for hymnals and other items. So if you open your service booklet, whenever you see something written in bold print, that is when you respond. Please rise now for the order of confession. Oh, I'm, I apologize, I made a mistake, take a seat. <laughs> So sorry, Debbie. <laughs> Debbie has a men's chorus who are going to sing to us before the service.
now please rise for the order of confession. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the aid of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit, that attentive to your word, we may confess our sins, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us now confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, now and in our Things done. Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen us through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in our hearts through faith. Amen. Our gathering hymn today can be found in your hymn booklet, God of the Sparrow. Christ with the Holy Spirit in the glory of God the Father. 
Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for our Bible reading. Good morning. Good morning. The reading is from Job 38, 1 through 11. The Lord answered child, Job out of the whirlwind. Who is that, this, that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man. I will question you, and you shall be clear to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding, who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the heavenly beings shouted for joy? Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment? thick darkness and swaddling band, and prescribed bounds for it, and set bars and doors, and said, Thus far shall you come, and no farther, and here shall you crowd waves be stopped. Word of God, word of life. Okay, this is from Psalm 107, verses 1 to 3, 23 to 32. Give thanks to the Lord, for the Lord is good. For God's mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord proclaim that God redeemed them from the hand of the foe. Gathering them in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some of them are receiving ships, flying their trade into waters. They beheld the works of the Lord, God's wonderful works in the deep. And they are soaked and swarming in the groves. They mounted up to the heavens and descended to the depths. Their sword, souls melted away in their peril. We then in their trouble they cried to the Lord, and you delivered them from their distress. You stilled the storm to the whisper, and silence the waves. Then were they glad when it grew calm, when you guided them to the harbor they desired. But then they give thanks to you, Lord, for your steadfast love and your wonderful works for all the people. Let them exalt you in the assembly of the people, in the council of the elders. Let them sing hallelujah. The reading for today is from 2 Corinthians. Chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. As we work together with him, we urge you also not to accept the grace of God in vain. For he says, at an acceptable time I have listened to you, and on a day of salvation I have helped you. See, now is the acceptable time. See, now is the day of salvation. We are putting no obstacle in anyone's way, so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we have commended ourselves in every way through great endurance, in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, holiness of spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, and the power of God with the weapons of righteousness, for the right hand and for the left, in honor and dishonor. Ill repute and good report. We are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet are well known, as dying and sick. We are alive, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing everything. We have spoken frankly to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open to you. There is no restriction in our affections, but only in yours. In return, I speak as to children. Open wide your hearts also. 
word of God, his word of life. And thank you God. Please rise for our gospel acclamation. Our gospel is taken from the book of Mark, chapter 4, beginning at verse 35. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let's go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind them, they took with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep in a cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind ceased and there was dead calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this? that even the wind and the sea obey him. Here ends the reading. Please be seated. There was a time not too long ago when I could watch a TV weather forecast and understand what they were talking about. In those days, it was very simple. Somebody would stand in front of a map board They'd have a little rubber cloud with a magnet on the back on one hand and the sun in the other. And they would stick the cloud up there, it's cloudy, it's sunny over there, and the temperature is 73 degrees. We all knew where we were. Not so today. We have Hurricane Swartz, we have Ultimate Doppler Radar, and Storm Tracker 6. I have no idea what that is, but it's very exciting. And we have this new thing called feels like. It's 76 degrees, but it feels like 90. Who says so? Where do they get that? What a great job to be the person who decides what it feels like. And in winter, it's worse. It's 27 degrees, but it feels like minus 10. So it doesn't matter what the temperature actually is. It's whatever somebody thinks it feels like. Now I think we're onto a good thing here. I know several women who are 50 but would like to feel like the 30. <laughs> and somebody is talking about cold fronts and isobars and we don't have humidity anymore. It's called dew point now. And they have blue screens, so there's multiple pictures flashing across and symbols flashing and the days of the week start floating around in a circle. And I'm so distracted by what's happening on the screen I'm not listening to what they're saying. But don't worry, because at the end, they give you a summary. Monday, sunny, 73. Tuesday, rainy, 64, and so on. That's all I need to know. I suspect that all around the country there are people watching this dazzling display with no idea what they're talking about. And like me, they're just waiting for that summary at the end. Of course, 2,000 years ago, we didn't have Hurricane Swartz, and we didn't switch on to see what Cecily Tynan is wearing today. But farmers and fishermen in those days were pretty good at looking at the sky and telling what the weather is going to be. But in today's Gospel story, something unexpected happened. It's a familiar story. Jesus calms the storm. There have been many famous paintings of that, including my favorite by Rembrandt. Uh, yet I believe it's an important story. It tells us more about the disciples and their relationship with Jesus at this particular time in his ministry. And it has an important message for us today. So Jesus says, let's take a boat across the lake. And so they do. And a big storm suddenly arrives and they are in danger. Now, a typical fishing boat in those times was about 9 meters long, that's about 25, 26 feet, and the sides were cut away sides very low so they could more easily cast the net over the side. So it isn't surprising that the Bible tells us within minutes, water sloshed over and they were already swamped. What's surprising to me is why they were there at all. The disciples were all natives of that area, 
Some of them were fishermen. Why would they go out in a boat if there was a storm brewing? Perhaps they simply followed Jesus because he said so. He was the boss. He said, let's take a boat across the lake. So they did. Or it could be, and we know now that the geography of the area around the Sea of Galilee is peculiar and a sudden storm can erupt without warning. So perhaps it was one of those storms. Anyway, a storm erupts, the boat is swamped and they fear for their lives. So what do they do? They turn to Jesus. And what's he doing? Lying in the stern. That's the back of the boat, for those of you who don't live in the river town. And he has his head on the cushion asleep. Not surprising, he spent the last few days preaching and teaching to crowds of people and he needs a rest. What I thought was strange was why did they rush to Jesus for help? They were locals, they knew the lake, some of them were fishermen, some of them were experts at sailing this kind of boat. But they run for help to a man whose only work experience is helping his father as a carpenter handyman. What did they know about Jesus at this time? They knew him as a carpenter, an itinerant preacher and teacher, and recently they had come to realize that he was the Messiah, the one chosen to be the leader of his people, but they still thought of him only as a human being, not as divine. So why turn to Jesus? My theory is that they thought of Jesus as an NBL. That's a natural born leader. You always find them, don't you, when something happens, somebody steps forward and takes charge. There are people who are just natural born leaders. In the 1930s, uh, Winston Churchill had long retired from politics. People thought he was past it. He spent his days in his country house reading and painting pictures. But when World War II started, the people of Britain turned naturally to Winston Churchill, quite rightly, as we now know, uh, for he was a natural born leader. I think that's how the disciples thought of Jesus. He always seems to know what to do. Let's ask him. So they ask him. Now he surprises them. He doesn't start to issue orders to lower the sails or man the tiller. He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was dead calm, and the disciples were stunned. Who is this, they said, that even the wind and the sea obey him? And then they realize the answer. For they know their scriptures. They read the psalm that we read today. They know that only God can control the natural elements. And I think for the first time they realize that Jesus is a great teacher, healer, and leader, but he's also the Son of God. Those of us who work with children know that great teachers don't teach. They enable their students to learn. Perhaps that's what Jesus is doing here, providing for the first time an opportunity for the disciples to discover for the first time that this natural born leader is also the Son of God. Well, we all have storms in our lives, don't we? You lose your job, you lose a loved one, you can't pay the mortgage, the car breaks down. And my mother, who as some of you know is very famous for her sayings, she always used to say, it never rains but it pours. <laughs> and she's right, isn't she? The same week your car breaks down, the roof starts leaking, and then you lose your wallet. One storm after another. Being a Christian doesn't make life easy, but God is our refuge. He provides us with a safe haven and the shelter from the storms of life. When I was very young, my mother told me a story of a man who was seeking shelter. Now, in order to tell you this story today, I have to take you on a trip. But that's okay, you haven't been anywhere for the past 18 months, so <laughs> I'd like to take you on a trip over the sea to where I was born, in the west of England, quite near a village called Cheddar. 
Cheddar is a lovely little village surrounded by towering limestone cliffs. It's not the Grand Canyon, we're a little more modest in our scenery, but it's still very impressive. And geologists come from all around the world to study these ancient rocks and caves filled with dazzling stalactites and stalagmites. You know the difference, don't you? <laughs> stalactites has a C in the word, so they hang down to the ceiling. Stalagmites have a G in it, so they grow up from the ground. <laughs> My father told me that. You see the importance of dads. <laughs> but the main reason cheddar is famous is because it was there that cheddar cheese was invented. When I lived there as a child, naturally our cheddar cheese was made by the farmers in cheddar. But as I grew up and started traveling, I came across New York cheddar and New Zealand cheddar. I thought, that's like buying a Philly cheesesteak made in Idaho. <laughs> you can't call wine champagne unless it's actually made in the Champagne region of France, otherwise it's simply sparkling wine. So how can you call it cheddar if it's not made in cheddar? Well, here's the answer. To make cheese, you have to take the milk and separate the curds from the whey. And the people of Cheddar invented a special way of doing that by pressing the cheese into blocks and squeezing the liquid out. And they called it cheddaring. So if you make cheese that way by cheddaring, it's cheddar cheese wherever you make it. It's a verb, not a noun. I think just between ourselves, if you've eaten cheese that's made actually in cheddar, everything else tastes like rubber. But <laughs> The cheese is stored in the caves there for 12 months, 18 months, sometimes even three years to give it a good taste. Well, some time ago they discovered a cave in Cheddar where there was a skeleton. Scientists tested it and the skeleton was 10,000 years old. It is in fact the oldest human remains ever discovered. They called him Cheddar Man, a whole new subspecies of human cave dwellers. Uh, they extracted DNA from the skeleton, would you believe? And then someone said, why don't we test all the people who live in the village of Cheddar? They may be somebody who's descended from this man. Well, it seemed unlikely, but they tested them. And one man, a man called Anthony Target, had the same DNA as Cheddar Man. He's the only man who can trace his ancestors back 10,000 years. And funnily enough, he was the history teacher in the local school. Children are notorious for thinking of nicknames for their teachers. I think from then on he was known as Cheddar Man. Shortly afterwards, this is when it gets really dramatic, some human bones were found in the cave with human teeth marks on them. And the scientists reluctantly admitted that Cheddar Man and his family were possibly cannibals. I don't know if this is true, but one of Mr. Target's students told me that he had no problem with discipline. He only had to bare his teeth. <laughs> and they all quickly got into line. So one day, as we sat on the grass in Cheddar, my mother told me this story. We were having a picnic. Let's imagine we're sitting there too, having a picnic. My mother told me that in the 1760s, a young minister called the Reverend Augustus Toplady was appointed as the new pastor or curate, as we call it, to a church in the Mendip Hills near Cheddar. And he wasn't very happy. He hadn't made a very good start to his first ministry. He was young, and his advanced views were not popular with the congregation. They didn't like him. And even worse, he had criticized John Wesley, the much-loved founder of the Methodist Church, who also lived nearby. Augustus Toplady was a follower of John Calvin, who believed in a doctrine called predestination, which the Methodists absolutely rejected. I'm not going to talk about predestination, you'll have to look that up, it's complicated. Let's just say that division between different denominations is nothing new. So his congregation didn't like him, he was finding the job very difficult. And of course, the main pastor sent him off to visit all the congregation who lived miles away on the outskirts of Cheddar in various farms. So here he is tramping over the gorge on foot. He's very depressed, walking across the rocky Mendip Hills. He's got all these problems 
on his shoulders, and would you believe it, it starts to rain. And then thunder. And then there's lightning everywhere, and he realizes his very life is in danger. And he looks around him and he spots a cave. It's not even a cave, it's more of a, a cleft in the rock. And he climbs inside and shelters from the storm. And the Reverend Top Lady feels safe. And he looked around him and it occurred to him that this ancient rock has been there forever and is sheltering him from the storm. And he thinks just like God, God has been there forever, sheltering us from the storms of life. The storm, in this case, hadn't gone away, but he had a safe refuge from it. His problems wouldn't disappear, but God would give him the strength and the power to overcome them. God was his refuge and his strength. And in that cave, sheltering from the storm, he wrote the hymn, Rock of Ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Augustus Top Lady, such a wonderful name, isn't it? The Reverend Augustus Top Lady went on to become a successful preacher, a much loved author of Christian books, composer of many other hymns, and the founder and editor of the Gospel magazine, which is still published today, 260 years later. And that cave or cleft in the rock is still there. If you want to see it, I put some photos in the narthex you can look at afterwards. As a child, we always had our family picnics there. And I remember my cousins and I playing hide and seek in the Rock of Ages, the words of the hymn still written on the wall. In recent years, one of those people who liked to rewrite history said, this must be just a myth, he made up that story. Who could write the hymn in a cave? Well, there's plenty of contemporary evidence from people who worked with him that it is indeed true. And besides, that critic obviously wasn't a musician. <laughs> I've been writing songs and music for over 50 years, and I've seldom been sitting at a keyboard when I did it. I once wrote a song on a train when I saw something in the opposite platform that inspired me. I had no paper and I wrote the words down in tiny letters on the back of my train ticket, carried it home with me. So of course, Augustus Top Lady could write a hymn in a cave. And what he learned that day, and how it changed his life, and eventually changed the life of many others, is obvious to all of us. There are those who preach the gospel of happiness, there are those who preach the gospel of wealth. Become a Christian and God will make you successful. The truth is that being a Christian does not make your life easy. We too have storms in our lives. But we have a God in whom we can put our trust. We have a God who will give us strength to carry on. And he will raise you up on eagle's wings and hold you in the palm of his hand. Just like Augustus Top Lady, we may find that the storm does not go away, but God will provide us with a safe haven. Psalm 46 says, God is our refuge and our strength, an ever-present help in times of trouble. Therefore, we will not be afraid. Our hymn of the day is, He Will Raise You Up on Eagle's Wings. We're going to dedicate this hymn to the memory of Bill Baxter. As you turn to your booklets, we're going to begin singing with the chorus for the refrain, which is on the back page, and then we'll go back to the verses. Okay? Please rise, let's sing together.
Let us now declare our beliefs in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of the
Let us now each pray, either silently or out loud, for those known to us who need God's healing or wisdom at this time. We lift all our prayers to you, O God, trusting in your abiding grace. Amen. 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 The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Yes, without shaking hands or hugging each other, we can just say, peace be with you to those near us. justice and love, we give thanks to you that you illume our way through life with the words of your Son. Give us the light that we need, awaken us to the needs of others, and at the end bring all the world to your feast. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory forever. Amen. Amen. Let us say together the prayer which Jesus himself taught us. Our Father, Right in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thy will is the kingdom. God be your refuge and your strength. May the grace of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. For our final hymn today, let us sing those words written 260 years ago by Augustus Toplady, but still true today, Rock of Ages.
Yes, praise the Lord. 